Welcome to week nine of Growing in Christ. I am so grateful that you have chose to join us today. Man, I would just encourage you to share this, to grab a group of people, to bring them around you um, so that you can study the Word of God together. I would encourage you after you walk through this to then take somebody through this so that they can begin to understand, so that they can begin to grow in their relationship with the Lord. Well, today we're in week number nine, and the focus of week number nine is love. And the verse for um, today is John 13, 34, and 35. And it says this, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so that you may love one another. And then it says this, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And so with that, there's three questions that I want you to think about, and I'm going to give you a little time. Um, but the first question is this, what is Christ's new commandment to us? And then whose example of love are we to follow? And then what will result when Christ shows one another the same kind of love Jesus extended to us? And so what, what, what kind of love do we see? And so answer those three questions, we'll come right back together. And so looking at John 13, 34, and 35, what is the new commandment that Jesus is giving? And the new commandment is this, is to love one another. And and it's to love one another as Christ has loved us. Like he is the example for us. The disciples ask Jesus and they say, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Like if we were to just follow one commandment, what would that one commandment that we should follow be? And he said, love the Lord with all your, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And he said, and then the second is like it. And he said this, love the Lord, uh, you know, love your neighbors as yourself. And so the first one is love God with all your heart. And then he says, love others. And so Jesus is very particular in the fact that his response that he wants us to have for people is to love them. But then not only that, in, in his statement to the disciples, he said, love them the way that you have loved yourself. And then he says, I give you a new commandment. And he says, love people the way that I have loved you. He says, there's an example that I've been setting of my love for you. And I want you to love people that way. I want you to love people the way that I have loved. What does that mean? It means that sacrificial love. Now, as you and I look back on the life of Jesus, we see what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about this sacrificial love that we're to love him in the same sacrificial way. And we're to love others in the same sacrificial way that he has loved us in giving himself for us, in putting us in front of himself. And so that's what he's telling uh, his disciples right here. It is a new command I'm giving you. And he says, I want you to love people the way that I have loved you. And so how has Jesus loved you? That's what we've got to go back and we've got to look at. Well, first of all, he loved you, the Bible says, in spite of your sin. And so in the middle of your sin, it says that God still loved you in the middle of our rejection. And so our love is not based and conditioned on the way that other people treat us. Our love is not based and conditioned on the way that people respond to us. Our love is not conditioned based on what other people do. Our love is conditioned only on Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And so that's the way that we base our love. And so that's what he's saying. He's saying, I love people that don't even love me. He said, I, I, I love people that are standing in the crowd and they're pointing their finger and they're saying, crucify him. I died and I love those people. And I want you to begin to have a heart like that. And I want you to begin to love people that way. I want you to love people that's hard to love. Love people that look at you and they don't agree with you. Love people that maybe have a different view than you do. Love people that look at you and say, you're crazy. I want you to love them. And so then the second question is this. Uh, whose example are we to follow? Well, we've covered this Christ example. I mean, we love 
the way that Christ loves. And, and so that's that's the example he wants us to follow. And then what will result when Christians show one another um, one another the same kind of love that Jesus extended to us? It, it says this at the end. It says that people will know that you are Jesus' disciple because of your love for one another. And, and so you want people to understand. You want people to see. You want people to know that you're a follower of Jesus. Love people. Love people. It's the greatest thing that you can do. You love the unlovable. You love those that reject you. You love those that disagree with you. People will begin to see, yeah, how, how are you responding this way to me? How are you loving me even though I've been so terrible to you? How, am I, how are you loving me even though I've been so awful to you? And so we love, and that love is a result, and that love is an evidence of God's work in our life, and it proves to people that we are Christ followers. Our love for other people. Listen, it's easy to love people that love us. That's not what he's talking about. It's easy to do that. Everybody does that. You don't have to be a follower of Jesus to love people that love you. It's loving the people that can't stand you, loving the people that disagree with you, loving the people that don't like you. It's those people that Jesus is talking about right here. And then it says, when you do that, people will begin to look at your life and they will say, there's something different about him. There's something different. And they'll be able to see what God is doing in your life. And it will be an evident that you are a follower of Jesus because of the way that you love people. The next verse is Matthew 22, 37 through 39. And what commandments does Christ emphasize in Matthew uh, 22, 37 through 39? Answer that question. We'll come right back together. And so what commandment does Christ emphasize in Matthew 22, 37 through 39? Well, it says this. Well, we talked about it a little at the beginning. He said to them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then he said, this is the greatest and most important commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so what does he emphasize here? First thing is this. Love God first. When you get this right, it's easier to love other people. When you realize the love that God has for you and what he's done for you, it makes it a little easier for you to then love other people. And so when you put God number one and you love him first and foremost in your life, then everybody else can really fall in the line and it makes it a lot easier to love other people. And so if we love him first, but if we put, if we change that order and we put people first, people will always fail us and people will always disappoint us. And in that disappointment, then we lose trust. And in that lack of trust, it's hard to love people the way that God loves us. But if we will love God, who will never disappoint, who will never let us down. If we love him first and then base our love off of who he is and what he's done for us, then... We can love people the way that we're supposed to love people. And so it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. What does that mean? That means with everything that is inside of you. Every passion that you have, every thought that you have, every spiritual act that you can do, love God with everything that is inside of you. Go after him with everything that you have. And so that's what he's talking about right here. Love God first and then love people. If you get it in those orders, it's a lot easier to love people the way that we're supposed to love people. But the next question is this. 1 John 4, 7. What is the source of love according to 1 John 4, 7? Read that. We'll come right back together.
1 John 4, 7, what is the source of our love? It says this, Dear friends, let us continue in love for one of a, for one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. And so here's the thing. Our source, well, when we get down to it, we, we are like a, a, a branch planted into a tree. And, and when we get down to it, the source of our substance of love comes from God. The reason that we are able to love the unlovable, the reason that we are able to love those that are hard to love is because our source is not ourself, it's coming from God. And so our love comes from the love that we have for who God is and what God's doing in our life. And so understand, you're not loving in your ability. You're loving through the overflow of what God is doing in your life. And so as God works in you, love is a result that comes out of God working in you. You can't help but love people. Your response to people, when they treat you wrong, when they treat you bad, it's not to get even. It's not to come back at them, but it's a love for them. It's a brokenness for them. that they would see who God is and what God desires to do in their life. They, they would begin to see how God can change who they are from the inside out. That's not a normal response. Well, when somebody treats you bad, for you to desire for them to have the best life that they could possibly have, for, for them to find a hope in a future, that's not normal. But that's because our source is not ourself, but our source is God. So the next um, question is this, according to John 3.16, what, uh, what does God's love, or, or who does God love according to John 3.16? Read that, we'll come right back together. So according to John 3.16, who does God love? Well, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Who does God love? God loves the world. So here's the question. If you and I are to love like God loves, who do we not have to love? If you and I, if our responsibility, if our response is to love the same way that God loves, then who do we not have to love? We have to love everybody. Think about it. Think about those that are hard to love, those those that have hurt you so deeply. What is it going to take in order for you to love them? What is it going to take in order for Jesus to be that substance that you need, that you're not loving them, out of who you are and what they've done to you, but you're loving them based on who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Because here's what the Bible says, God loves the world. And if we are to love like him, there is nobody that we cannot love. We have to love everybody. And that makes it difficult because there are some people that make it really, really hard to love them. I mean, I can think of some things, some people that, uh, you know, have made statements and said things and hurt, and it makes it difficult to love because your natural response is defense. Your natural response is to protect. Your natural response is to get even. But what God desires for us to do is to love them in spite of their statements and love them in spite of who they are. Love them because Jesus loves you. And so who who do we have to love? Everybody. The next question is this. What is the result of obeying God's word according to 1 Peter 1.22? And so what results from loving people? Um, 1 Peter 1.22, read that and we'll come right back together. And so according to 1 Peter 1, 22, uh, what is a result of obeying God's word? 
Well, it says, by obedience of the truth, having purified yourself for sincere love of the brothers, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So what is the result? Sincere love and a pure heart. What does sincere love mean? Well, it means you're not putting on a show and you're not faking what you're saying and what you're doing. See, love is a verb. Love is an action. And so love is it has to be seen. You can't just speak the words and say, I love you without it being followed by an action. And so love has to be followed. Uh, the actions have to follow the words love. It would be one thing for me to look at my wife and say, I love you, but never prove that love. It would be one thing for me to be able to say, hey, babe, I, I love you with all my heart. But then, man, I, I, I never talk to her. I never spend time with her. I, I'm frustrated and mad at her all the time. We're arguing all the time. We, we sleep in different rooms. Uh, you know, we, we never have dinner together. We never go on dates. But then I look at her and every day I'm telling her I love you. She would question those words that I'm saying because the actions do not follow those words. See, what you have to understand, sincere love is proving the words. A, a sincere love means I'm going to say the words, but I'm also going to prove these words. And so it's sincere love. That's a result of obeying God's word. We can love people that don't love us. Sincerely. Uh, we can respond with love when people are, are mean, when people say hurtful things. We can respond in love. And, and it can be sincere. And so, but not only that, a pure heart. We can do it without really lying to ourselves. Like even though we may say the words like, I'm good, I forgive you, no big deal. But then in the heart, there may be this, this bitterness that's building up in the heart. And it's saying when you obey the word of God, you don't have those issues. When you obey who God is and what God is doing in your life, when you love it, the way that God calls us to love, we have a pure heart before people and we can honestly look at them and no matter what they've done to us, we can look at them and we can say, Hey, you, man, I forgive you. Let's move forward. Why? Because we realize that Christ forgave us of so much more, so much more pain, so much more hurt, so much more struggle. And so because of that, we can then return that love to other people and we can have a clear pure heart and stand before God and say, I have loved and I have loved well. And so the next verse is John 15, 12 and 13. How did Jesus demonstrate his love? And so when we look at Jesus, how is it that it was demonstrated? How was Jesus using love as a verb? John 15, 12 and 13. Read that. We'll come right back together. And so how did Jesus prove his love for us? How did he demonstrate his love? Well, John 15, 12 and 13 says this. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. How has he loved us? Well, he's going to show us in verse 13. Uh, no one has greater love than this. That someone would lay down their life for a friend. What's the greatest act of love that you could possibly ever show somebody to sacrifice your life for them? The greatest act. You can't get your life back. And so you sacrifice your future in order to save their life. It's a picture of someone standing in front of a car and a car speeding fast. You run out, jump, push them out of the way. You get hit by the car and you die. Why is that the greatest act of love? Why is not buying flowers? Why is not something else? Because you recognize love is this, recognizing that their life is more valuable than yours. That's the greatest picture of love that you can ever give. When you look at somebody and you say, I value you more than I value me. And so think about it in context of a husband and a wife. Think about it in context of your kids. Oftentimes, what do we do in those relationships? 
Oftentimes in those relationships, what we end up doing is we become selfish. Most of the time when Heather and I have conversations with people about their relationships, about their marriage, the number one issue is this. In that relationship, they have become very selfish. They begin to look at themselves and they begin to think, I deserve this, I deserve that, I should have this, I should have that. And in thinking that way, What ends up happening is they begin isolating themselves and then they begin getting frustrated because they're not being treated and they're not, they forgot the sacrificial aspect of love. They forgot the aspect that says, I want to value you more than I value me. I want you to know that I love you and the greatest way that I could ever show you that I love you is by placing you in a position of honor higher than me. The greatest thing that Jesus could ever do. Listen, there is nothing that Jesus could come back and do to show and to prove that he loves you anymore. Nothing. If Jesus came back and performed miracles and you were sick and you were dying of a disease and Jesus came back and touched you, that does not prove his love greater than what he's already proven for you. He died for you. He died on the cross, taking your place, The sin has a punishment and your sin carries the punishment of death. And Jesus went to the cross and he died on the cross for you. He took your place. There's nothing greater that he could do to prove to you that he loves you than dying on the cross. There's nothing greater that you could do for somebody than saying, I am going to elevate you greater than me. I'm going to consider your life as greater than mine. That's the most beautiful and great picture of love that you and I could ever give. And that's what Jesus did for us. He sacrificed himself. 1 John 2, 5. How did John say God's love is shown in our lives? And so read 1 John 2, 5 and figure out how is God's how is God's love shown in our lives? So according to 1 John 2, 5, how is God's love shown through us? It says, but whoever keeps his word, truly in him, the love of God is perfected. This is how you know we are in him. How how do you know what Christ is doing in your life? How how do you know you're a follower of Christ? You, You obey what God says. You keep his word. You look to his word and you obey what he says. So what is part of what he says in his word? Loving other people. How do you know you're a follower of Christ? How do you know you're a disciple? How do you prove? How do you see God's word working, God's love working in your life? Through his word. By obeying what his word says. By following what the word of God says. By opening the word of God and looking and seeing that the word of God says love is a verb. Love is an action. And we, we prove every day that we love people by the way that we, we live our lives. And by the way that we live our lives proves to people that we're followers of Jesus Christ. When people look at us, they should see something different. When people interact with us, they should, they should see and sense and feel something different. There should be something. Why? Because the love of Jesus... It's coming off of our lives. It's being expressed in everything that we do. It's being shown in every single area of our life. It's a different response to people. When they're mean, when they're terror, it's responding in love. And loving them in spite of how they treat us or what they say. That's what the Word of God is telling us to do. So how do we know that God's love is working in our lives? Because we're obeying God's word and we're loving people the way that God has called us to love. Um, 1 John 2, 6, right below it. What indicates that an individual is rightly related to Christ? 
And so what is that indicator? One verse down, 1 John 2, 6. Read that. We'll come right back together. And so the one that says, first uh, John 2, 6, uh, the one who says he remains in God, the one that says I have a relationship with God, the one that says I, I am a child of God, the one that says I am saved, should walk as Jesus walked. So what does that mean? We should be imitators of Christ in every aspect of his life. We should imitate him. And so this chapter is about love. So what should we imitate him in? We should imitate him in his love for people. Why? By this, all people will know that you are his disciples. Why? Because of your love for one another. What does that mean? That means I'm imitating who Jesus is and what he's done. I'm following the example that Christ has placed in me. I'm following who Jesus is. And I'm saying, God, I understand what you've done. I understand how you've worked. I I see it in scripture and I want to model and mimic that. Paul says this. Paul says, imitate me because I'm going to be imitating Christ. You want to be more like Jesus? Then follow me. And and that's what Jesus is saying right here. You want to love people? Then follow me. You want people to know that you're my disciple? Then follow me in every area of your life. How are people to know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, you should walk in the way that he walked. You should follow every step that he took. Look and see how did he treat people? How did he respond when when people were negative to him? How did he respond to crowds of people who were pressing in and who were screaming at him and saying that you're a false prophet? How, how did he respond when people wanted to sit and debate and, and, and try and catch him in, in a lie? And, and through it all, he loved people. He shared truth and he loved people. And his ultimate goal is for people to spend eternity in heaven with him. And so what should you and I do? We walk in the way that Jesus walks. We love people. One of the greatest things we can do in loving people is telling them about Jesus. It's one of the greatest things. You want to know what you can do to help people is tell them about Jesus. Share the gospel. Tell them that they are a sinner and because of their sin, it has separated them from God. And that sin carries a consequence. And that consequence is an eternity separated from God in the place the Bible describes as hell. And so sin has a consequence. It's death. Eternal separation from God. But then through the grace and the mercy and the love of Jesus Christ, Jesus came down to the earth. He left heaven, came down to the earth, lived 33 years, a perfect, spotless, sinless life. And then he died the death that you and I deserve. Because sin carries a consequence. The consequence is death. And Jesus came to the earth and he died so that you and I could have a relationship with his father. And so now because of what Jesus Christ has done, you and I can spend our eternity in heaven. The greatest act of love that you can show people is telling them about Jesus. Saving them from themselves. Letting them know the path they're taking is not the path that leads to Jesus. And so how do people know that you're a follower of Jesus? You walk in the way that he walked. You do what Jesus did. You talk about the kingdom of heaven. But the next thing is this. In Galatians 5.13, how did Paul teach Christians to exercise freedom? How did Paul teach Christians to exercise freedoms? Uh, Galatians 5.13. Turn there, read it, we'll come right back together.
So Galatians 5.13, how did Paul teach Christians to exercise freedoms? Well, verse 13 says this, for you are called to freedom. Brothers, only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Well, what does this mean? This means that through Jesus Christ, you have been forgiven of your sins of the past and your sins of the future. And so you are no longer held accountable for your sin because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And so when you die, you don't have to pay the penalty for your sins of the past and the sins that you are going to commit in the future. There is a freedom now for you and I. Can I go out and can I say all the words that I want to say? Can I be mean and terrible and still spend my eternity in heaven? The way that I can is because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And so Paul's saying there's a freedom. But he's also saying, but here's the thing. Don't let that freedom change what God desires to do in your life. What did the verses just right before that say? I mean, you want to you wanna be a follower of Jesus? Then follow who Jesus is. And so it's saying just because you're forgiven doesn't mean you can go out and live however you want. Doesn't mean that you should go out and do and say and act however you want. And it's saying don't live according to the flesh. Don't live according to who you used to be. But now respond and live in love. The love that God has shown you. And so don't live how you used to be. Don't, don't respond in the way that you used to respond. But respond the way that God desires for you to respond. Respond in love. Respond the way that God desires. Be who God has created you to be. Just because there is a freedom there does not mean that we are to exercise that freedom. God desires something different. God desires something better. God desires something more in our lives for you and us. We are forgiven of sin, past, present, and future. But that does not mean that we live life however we want. That means we understand who we were and how we got to this point. And so now our freedom is exercised in the love that God has for us. And so now I respond not according to who I was, but I respond according to who I am in Christ. And so I don't abuse the freedom that there is in front of me. I don't take advantage of who God is and what God has done for me. That is not love. And so what I do, I'm obedient to who Christ is and what Christ has done for me. And I follow that. And I live according to his word. The next one, 1 John 4, 10. Describe God's love according to 1 John 4, 10. Read that. We'll come right back together. First John 4 10 says this love consists of this not that we loved God but that he loved us and he sent his son to be our propitiation for our sins and so here's what the verse is saying describe God's love God loved us before we loved him and God already had a plan to redeem us and to make us right before we ever chose to love him and God has a plan for those that are never going to choose to love him. He has a plan for them also. He, he has a plan. He sent his son and died for those who are never going to accept and love him. Before you ever loved God, God loved you. And our response to God's love is to open our arms and to say thank you and accept his love so that then we can have forgiveness of sin. So that then we can spend our eternity in heaven with him. And so God loves you before you ever chose to love him. God loved you in the middle of your sin. It says that Christ died for you. In the middle of your rejection of God, God looked down and God said, I love you. And he loved you. And he gave himself for you. John 13. Um, 
Jesus gave his followers a new command to love one another. John 13, 34 and 35. How did he demonstrate his love to them according to John chapter 13? Read that and then we'll come right back together. John chapter 13, how did Jesus demonstrate his love for the disciples? Well, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And in verse 12, he said, uh, When Jesus had washed their feet and put the robe on, he reclined and again said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and this is well said, for I am. And he said, So if I am Lord and I am teacher, and if I have washed your feet, you also ought to wash the feet of others. For I have given you the example that you should also do just as I have done. And so what is Jesus trying to say and trying to show right here to his disciples? I mean, in this day when you get the picture, I mean, it's dirty, dust, and uh, their feet are going to stink. Their feet are going to be sweaty. They're going to have dirt caked all over them. And this man that is supposed to be Lord and Master bends over and washes their feet. This isn't what they did in those days. They've never seen an example like this before. They've never seen somebody of such high stature come down and wash somebody's feet. They never would have seen this. And so for Jesus to do this, it was astonishing to the disciples. Because this isn't the picture that they've ever seen before. And for us, what I think Jesus is trying to tell us today is this. The picture of love is not what you see from other people. But the picture of love that you and I are to follow is the picture that Jesus is setting for us. To love people in a way that will absolutely astound them. As the disciples sat there and Jesus went around and he washed all of their feet, I can imagine the disciples looking around going, what in the world is going on? Jesus, don't you shouldn't be touching me. You shouldn't be doing this. I should be washing your feet. This isn't how it's supposed to work. And Jesus is saying, but how it's worked in the past hasn't worked at all. And so maybe some things need to change. Maybe some things need to change in your life because how it's worked in the past has not worked. And so maybe you're looking at your life and you're realizing that I love God, but I don't love people. And maybe today what God is trying to speak into you and what God is trying to tell you is that I want you to change your thinking on love. I want you to begin loving people the way that you're supposed to love people and loving people well and not love them because they loved you. It's easy to love people who love you, but love the people that are hard to love because that's what Jesus did and what you and I as followers of Jesus to prove that we are his disciples, we love one another. Love well today. Don't just say it. Prove it. Let your actions show how much you love Jesus. Be the example. Love people in a different way. Uh, love people in a way that blows their mind. And, and when they respond wrong, you respond right. So I want you to know we love you. I'm so grateful that you have tuned in today. Man, I pray that this is a blessing to you and to all those that are watching with you. I pray that you can take this teaching and you are going to be able to grow in your relationship with Christ. I cannot wait to see you next week for week number 10 of Growing in Christ. Have a wonderful week.